Well, thank you, Tom, for joining me on the program today. We're happy to have you, sir. Well, Joey, it's great to be here. And I also love the the title of your program, True 30. I'm an old enough journalist who actually used to write his stories on a typewriter. And at the bottom of the last page, we had to put hyphen 30 hyphen so the typesetter would know that was really the last page of the story and that something else wasn't still going to come. So I love the name of your program. Thank you so much. You were the first person to catch that on the fly. So I guess with your tenure as a reporter, that makes total sense. Thank you again. Um, so I have 12 pages of notes here, Tom, and we're not going to get through all of them. But it was one of those things as I continued to go through the book, I was like, oh, we have to talk about this. Oh, we have to talk about this. And there's just so many things. And this book you co-wrote with Andrew Hone. And for our listeners, allow me to highlight a little bit of Andrew's expertise for clarity and purpose of today's discussion. Andrew is currently the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at Rand Corporation and formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Bush administration, where he was charged with developing and implementing U.S. strategy, force planning, and long-term range policy planning. And although I've already pre-recorded your intro, I want to reintroduce it again, just in case people missed it. You're currently the Director of Media and National Security with the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. And previous to your now academic role, you were a Pentagon correspondent and editor for the New York Times for nearly a quarter century. And per our forthcoming discussion on Russia, which we will be having, you were the former bureau chief in Moscow for the Chicago Tribune. So I wanted to reiterate both the tenure of you and Andrew because we've had plenty of spectators in our war history, but rarely do we meet and speak to the folks that were actually embedded in said history. So thanks again for coming on the show, Tom. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Joey, for inviting me. And whenever you someone reads Andy's bio, I say to myself, well, clearly he's the brains of this operation. So, Well, you, you guys are both impressive on that front. And yeah, I think working in the Secretary of Defense uh, for the Bush administration qualifies you as someone that we should be listening to. Um, in your intro, you guys <clears throat> started out, and I'm going to read this because it, it really jumped off the page for me. It says the Pentagon, which spends billions on creating force multipliers, is only belatedly understanding how climate change is a threat multiplier, quote unquote. The nation's most important coastal installations for warships and Marines and counter jets could be underwater and useless <laughs> with rising sea levels. Increasing heat and moisture in the atmosphere affect the ability of military helicopters and warplanes to take off. That is a double curse because it will require aircraft to burn even more fossil fuels to meet the increasing need for lift. <laughs> so you really get into the idea of climate change as a overarching universal existential threat. And by the way, we're going to end on that because I want to start kind of in the other pieces of your book, almost in a linear fashion, uh, specific to how you kind of framed your, your book. You framed the many dangers faced by our federal government and their $1.25 trillion budget in two major sections. The first section being the warning machine and the second being the action machine. Can you break those down for us and tell us why you framed it that way and why I thought it was so powerful for me to, as a reader? Sure. Thanks very much. It's just so important. People talk about the government, you know, and like on 9-11, um, people said, well, why didn't anybody know about bin Laden and Al Qaeda? Well, it's like the question is really who, who knew? And that is the breakdown of this giant national security system for which all of us pay $1.2 trillion a year. So Andy and I, to make it sort of digestible, break it down into the warning machine. That's the entire apparatus of government that watches and listens and thinks and analyzes. It's, it's not just the intelligence community. I mean, open source inv information comes from the business community and from diplomats and all of that. And then all those reports and analysis get crunched for the action machine. And that's the executive branch, uh, the Pentagon, Health and Human Services, uh, Homeland Security, et cetera, who have to make decisions. And what Andy and I found, and it won't be any surprise to your listeners, Joey, is there's too often a disconnect between the warning machine and the action machine. Right. Sometimes the warning machine misses it outright. Sometimes the warning machine does warn, but to quote 1 Corinthians, it's an uncertain trumpet. It's not loud enough or clear enough to make the action machine do something. And sometimes it's crystal clear, direct, 
but the action machine is too busy, the president's inbox is full, or maybe there's not even a system to plug that warning into for the right kind of action, as we saw with COVID. We had all these disparate parts of the public health and private health system, but there wasn't anything ready to actually deal with pandemic after the warning began came clear. So we think, Joey, that that is a nice framework for understanding this rather colossal problem that actually doesn't require colossal fixes to make it better. That helps a lot. Thank you. And, and at the last sentence in your introduction, there was a quote by Eric Edelman, the defense department. I dare you. I dare you. I'm going to say <laughs> undersecretary for policy as well as ambassador to Turkey and Finland. And he said, and I quote, the reason we get things wrong so much in national security is because it's really fucking hard. <laughs> and I just laughed out loud when I was reading it. I was like, well, you know, that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> it, it, really it really, really does. And, you know, and whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent, and Mandy and I, I want to be really clear, we wrote an apolitical nonpartisan book. We call balls and strikes on both parties, all sides. But what Ambassador Edelman said is the truth. There are really good people trying to protect us, but it's really, really effing hard. And that's not an excuse. It doesn't, you know, give them a get out of jail free card, but we do have to understand these are big problems that should be debated on programs like yours, Joey, and not in the halls of a dysfunctional Congress or in an executive branch at war with itself. Now, it's a great point. And I, you know, stay in this linear path. You kind of started out in chapter one talking about World War II. Specifically, you said the machinery itself proved to be antiquated. It was an 18th century design being used for 20th century problems. And then you offered up Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor as an example, which proved to be the single greatest failure of warning in national security history. And to your earlier point, there are warnings. What took place there as far as our machinery not being up to par? Right. Well, there certainly were warnings. There's Alberta Wolstetter has a fantastic book. It's it's the size of a phone book, so I don't recommend it to everybody, <laughs> but it is one of the best histories, not only of World War II and its beginning, but of the, the, the failure of intelligence in the executive branch, because there were plenty of signals, but they got lost in the static. There wasn't one person in charge of assessing them, and that let America be surprised by the Japanese uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. And we were, you know, we were kind of a sleepy giant, and America's been fortunate throughout its its history that we are a, a, a clumsy giant. What's the giant clumsy mm -hmm. duck in the old Donald Duck film? Is it Baby Huey or whatever Baby Huey. I think yeah. <laughs> that's him. Baby Huey. That, that's the United States. We're this big stumbling giant. But if you kick us too hard, um, we do respond. And that's what we saw in World War II and Korea. Let's skip over Vietnam after 9-11. The same thing. We came out of World War I and as always kind of disbanded the army. We kept the somewhat, you know, Prussian echelons in, in, in shape. And World War II saw an absolute reinvention of the American military and a historic public-private partnership. Think of all the Rosie the Riveter signs that we've seen mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, automobile production was turned into tanks. And, and you know, whether you're a pacifist or, 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 or not, that public-private partnership, as we saw so successful World War II, is needed today to solve some of the problems. And then, of course, we can talk more about it. We came out of World War II and codified all these new changes in a National Security Act of late 1940s that basically created a brand new shiny 1947 Chevrolet with all the chrome and fins. And we had that, but we really didn't change that till 9-11 and that 47 Chevrolet just wasn't set for 2001. And can you talk a little bit about some of those changes that took place in the late 40s? I mean, I know that we I think that was it the NATO was established in 49 and, and we had, I don't have to have my notes, but you look at what we did specific with the CIA in the late forties as well. Right. All of the, um, you know, national security and defense 
things that people take for granted now came out of that act. The CIA, the national security process, uh, the, the Department of Defense as we know it today, all were born then. And that, you know, 47 Chevy ran pretty well, longer than a real 47 Chevy, ran pretty well into the 60s and, and, and 70s. And then there was a, a, a major restructuring, Goldwater Nichols, that forced the individual armed services Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines to operate in a more joint manner for the synergy that we know we have. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, Joey, and they people said, well, we, we got to trade in this 47 Chevy for a, for a much more modern vehicle. I don't want to say Tesla because it's free advertising, but, but we really <laughs> needed some kind of new car to replace the 47 Chevy. Yeah, well, and that's that's exactly it. And and you kind of went over, you know, a lot of the things that we've read about in history, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and, and some of those things worked out specific to our war and interaction systems. Um, and I think that that's really where, if you look at how you jumped, and again, Vietnam being a big piece of that, <clears throat> we missed a lot of those things on Vietnam as well. And I think that there's you know, we had 58,000 Americans were killed in Vietnam, 2 million North and South Koreans. And this was our first war broadcast in our living room. So everyone really got to see it firsthand, which changed a lot of things and kind of really helped us understand what we did wrong. And, and one thing that as a fan of uh, McMaster, General McMaster, you wrote about his PhD dissertation in your book and how it was actually called dereliction of duty. And it was a broad indictment uh, of the US military leadership across the board. And it's actually, I think it's required reading at the military colleges today, specific to that, correct? Yes. And, um, it, no, and it's, it's really a, a great book. And just one sort of brief asterisk footnote, my writing partner, Andy Hohen, also reminds us that when we got into the conflict on the Korean Peninsula, there was a thing called Task Force Smith that was dispatched as the first fighting force. They weren't ready. It was a disaster. It was a slaughter. But the lesson of Task Force Smith is the American military realized it has to be ready to fight to tonight. And so that lesson, they quickly learned and regenerated force, whereas in Vietnam, as we know, that was a long, hard slog. And what General McMaster writes about was that the best and the brightest really uh, were misleading the American people, were misleading the leadership, and were drinking their own Kool-Aid to believe they had a winning strategy when, when we were never going to win in Vietnam. No. Yeah, we had no chance there, and we know that from history. The fog of war for my listeners, if you haven't watched that, as a documentary with Bob McNamara, and he talks about the 11 things never to do again in times of war. And we repeat a lot of those, even in similar wars after that. So I think those are both nice, uh, nice pieces of history for you to mention in there. Um, and then you also also talk about, you know, the Gulf War. And you said the first Gulf War was a demonstration of America's newly tooled hard power, the modern remaking of the action machine. Yeah, that, that is exactly right. It really went into force, and, and it's where it was one of the, the major technological changes, the invention of nuclear weapons and what they meant for ending, or atomic weapons for ending World War II, and then nuclear weapons for keeping a very difficult peace with the Soviet Union. But the other, the next great technological change was uh, precision munitions. In, in Vietnam, the Air Force had to drop like 20 bombs to take out any one bridge. By the time of the Gulf War, you could be pretty guaranteed with one or two. And that was just a revolutionary kind of, of change. And just to bring it up to today, I don't want to anticipate the future questions, but we are now living through the next major iteration, which is the application of artificial intelligence to the military as well as to our lives. And that's going to be as big a challenge as nuclear weapons and precision guided munitions. Yeah, that is definitely one of the discussions that you guys went deep into. And one of the things also, as far as framing that helped me as a layperson understand, you talked about the 9-11 attacks being kind of our wake-up call specific to the machinery of the 1947 Buick and what that looks like. Another thing that you said that I thought really helped me understand it was, you called it the Zoom effect, right? And yes. I wanted you to kind of explain that because it was, it really helped me to understand what we did specific to terrorism versus traditional mechanized war. You want to talk a little bit about the Zoom effect that took place sure. after 
Sure. So in my 40 years as a journalist, and Joey, you're clearly a wordsmith as well, you know that words matter because the words you apply to a problem, how you define a problem, defines the solutions and either limits it, narrows it, or makes it possible. On 9-11, when the Bush administration labeled terrorism an existential threat, that launched all kinds of things on the action machine. We launched two wars. We spent trillions of dollars, uh, thousands of American casualties, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives in the Middle East changed and entire governmental structures. But on 9-11, only 3,000 people died. Now, any death above zero is a tragedy, but those 3,000 deaths prompted the Bush administration to define terrorism as existential, and they zoomed all of the American national security machine on terrorism. Compare that to COVID 20 plus years later. Okay. A million Americans have already died. More sadly will die than this winter. But this country never went on to a full mobilization or even agreed on whether COVID was an existential national problem. So Andy and I agree that terrorism absolutely was the central national security threat after 9-11. But not for 20 plus years, Joey. We clearly should have widened the aperture again. Right. At perhaps, at, you know, at the latest after bin Laden was killed, after Al Qaeda was decapitated, because what we let happen by spending another 10 years racking and stacking terrorists like cordwood and not putting attention on Russia, China, climate, health, climate, health, et cetera, we let all these other problems creep up. And it's time for our country to understand that climate security is national security, food security is national security, sure. data security, education. There are all these other pieces that make us a strong, secure nation. We spent too long focused Zoom like only on terrorism. And that's do you think that's has harmed us specific to how we actually manage wars globally today? It's, or we're still behind the eight ball on some of these issues? I think we are. And many of our structures still remain what they were after 9-11. Uh, okay. the, the, the amount of money in the budget. Look, this country is scrambling for artillery shells to help Ukraine and to keep our own military in, in stock. I mean, the, the preponderance of money that was spent on terrorism and counterinsurgency uh, I think we now realize some of that should have been spent on preserving the traditional conventional force, because what we're seeing in Ukraine after Russia's illegal invasion is the kind of war the American army prepared for for 50 years and then got told, don't do that, do counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. Right. And then there's the budget stuff that you talked about, which, you know, sadly was trillions of dollars what, with what we did in the Middle East with Iraq and Afghanistan. and and there was an art. This is actually from your book. It says the horrific collapse of American policy in Afghanistan in the summer of 2021 and the collapse of the Afghan security forces and government sponsored by the United States with trillions of dollars over 20 years followed a similar path, but with one important difference. The only people who were unaware of the fragility of Afghan's national security and defense forces were those who were not paying attention. And then you talk specifically about someone I've never heard of, uh, which is John Sopko. You want to talk a little bit about him and why he was so important yeah. to your narrative? Yeah, he's, he, he's sort of a personal hero of mine. He's been a guest <laughs> at my project twice. Uh, his title is crazy. It's the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, S-I-G-A-R. So give the man a cigar, cigar right? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And, and you know, in, in Greek mythology, uh, there's the story of Cassandra, who was blessed with the power to accurately predict the future, but because she pissed off one of the gods, he then cursed her with never being believed. That's John Sopko. If you look at his reports year after year after year, he said this money's being wasted, Afghan security forces are corrupt. Even if we do train them, why are we training them on a top-heavy, high-technology American army style when they should be trained given Afghan traditions from the village up? And so when our policy collapsed, Sopko came to my group. I asked him, how did this happen? He said two words, hubris and mendacity. We thought too much of ourselves and we lied to ourselves. Okay, so the hubris piece, 
does he mean in that we as a success a successful democracy in the West thought we could bring our military might and ideology to a new country and just install it like hey this is what we're gonna do and we're America and that's it go is that what he was talking about that is the t-shirt for hubris Joey you you got it, <laughs> it you got it, it, it exactly right you know I, I spent three years as Chicago City Hall bureau chief and there's an old phrase in Chicago this town ain't ready for reform well Afghanistan was not ready for Jeffersonian democracy, mm -hmm. um, a congressional presidential system, and a 21st uh, military. And again, that's not to be condescending or insulting. No. I spent months every year in Afghanistan. It's a beautiful country, a cultured country with intelligent, delightful people, but it's not the United States. And to think that we could spend money to turn it into a miniature Illinois was mm -hmm. just hubris. Speaking of that, how big is it compared to the United States? When you talk about Illinois, is that is that a comparison as far as geography? How big is Afghanistan? It's it's you know it's a fairly large country. So Illinois, it's, it's like you know maybe Alaska or so. And what, okay. what I love about Afghanistan for people who've, who've never been there, if it ever got its act together, it would be the most glorious tourist destination in the world. Hmm. In, in the south are, are these red sand deserts and cliffs that look like Mars. Um, the, the the mountains are magnificent. There's a finger of Afghanistan that goes up into China, part of the Himalayas, where there's a, a rare mountain trout that's three feet long. I mean, it's hiking, it's biking, it's fishing, great food, great carpets, and it's a heartbreaking tragedy that we failed and the Taliban have taken over again and are closing women's schools, are not letting women get educated, are, are executing those who simply want to live freely. It is a heartbreaking turn of events for a beautiful country. And was that part of our hubris in the sense that we could, I don't want to say that's a theocracy in its traditional terms, but obviously that's a big piece of how they govern, right? So, I mean, outside of us with the separation of church and state, that's kind of where the hubris comes in as well. Not understanding the, you know, millennial of the there's thousands of years that are are part of that culture and the same thing we're dealing with in the Middle East today with the you know, Hamas attack on Israel is that you see all these conversations with lay people talking about things they don't understand. And that was the thing for me as a student of history. I was baffled because when I read this, and I, I think it's worthwhile reading, this is Sopko's assessment. He actually compared what we did to Napoleon, saying the army moves on its stomach. And that is so true. And if you expect the Afghan military to win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people, you have to win the hearts and minds of the Afghan military. If you don't pay them, you don't feed them, you don't support them, you don't give them benefits to widows and orphans on a regular basis, you don't have medevac capabilities. Then the average Afghan soldier is saying, what the heck am I dying for? That's exactly right. And, and I also love your use of, of the millennial time frame, because one of the bumper <clears throat> stickers out of Afghanistan was that, you know, the Taliban lived there. We were just visiting. And so we might have had all the Rolex watches but they had all the time in the world to wait us out. Correct. And just based on this analysis, do you know from your reporting, what did we do as a mighty military when we went in there? Did we actually fail on the training? Did we fail on the pay? Did we, I mean, what does that look like? What was he talking about specifically on those fronts? All of the above, the very specialized unit that partnered with the high-end tier one American forces, they were really, really good and they okay. were very effective. But as we, but, but again, Afghanistan's a big country. As we tried to stand up uh, militia, police, and army units all across the country, the pay would go to a paymaster in Mazar or Kandahar far from U.S. eyes, and corruption is the same all over the world, that money would line a few pockets and would never get down to the soldiers who needed to be paid. The bullets were sold on the black market. Um, and so after a while, if you don't have bullets, if you're not getting paid, if all the good yeah. food's staying at headquarters, why on earth should you put your life on the line by patrolling the streets hunting Taliban? And so we 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 failed on that front, and that's where the hubris comes in, and the mendacity in general is that we didn't. Yeah, I mean, 
because if you look at this from a layperson perspective, you know, sitting on our couch watching this with my family and friends and relatives, and as I mentioned to you off camera, I come from uh, a very conservative family, so I have a lot of my friends that were not happy, and of course they blamed everything on Biden. But the idea there, and I actually had to agree, it didn't look good, right? What when you know that we have these things, you know that we have nine years of intelligence reporting saying that we are woefully inadequate on what we're doing here, and if we unplug quickly, which we're now saying we're going to do, this is what's going to happen. This is this parade of horribles that's going to take place. It was sent to us, everyone inside the military, not everyone, but to your reporting. That's what happened. It was a mess and it and it caused, you know, death and destruction and terrible optics. And it, it made us look foolish. Did it not? It absolutely did, and it weakened our prestige. And it's interesting, people like Sopko briefed Congress, his reports were public, but you had generations of leaders who had to keep saying, we're going to win, it's going okay, we're on our way, Sopko's a naysayer, don't mind him, trust me, I got it. And that's where your mention of H.R. McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, comes in into play. And I, I know a lot of these officers. They're 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 patriotic people. They you know spent years away from their their families, but they knew what was going on. But those messages again, the warning and action disconnect. Nobody wanted to hear that this trillion dollar effort to remake Afghanistan to look like the United States was going to fail. The sunk cost fallacy all personified right there, right? It just like, Exactly, Joey. Yeah, we have too much invested. We can't let it go. And I think that's also part of, you know, our global reputation of being arrogant, right? We're just going to go in and, and do something like that. It's, it's not just ambitious. It's, it seems foolish in hindsight. And, and if you look at the aforementioned fog of war, here's the 11 things not to do again. It's, <laughs> that's one of them is understand your enemy because they didn't. And it was the same kind of thing with Vietnam. They never would, they were never going to quit ever. Right. And, right. and Taliban's not going to quit either. <laughs> yeah. So no, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Andy and I were at it, Rand in Santa Monica a week ago, and I was chatting with Chuck Hagel, the former defense secretary, former senator from Nebraska, wounded in Vietnam as an enlisted soldier during the Tet Offensive. And he was one of the first to really, even though he's Republican, he's one of the first to challenge Bush on Iraq. And why? Having been in Vietnam, he said, I know what it's like when we evade a country that we don't understand. Right. Right. Bob McNamara said that with tears in his eyes. And that if he only would have talked to the leadership, you know, the top leadership within Vietnam, he would have known. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how many bombs we drop. It doesn't matter how many bridges, bridges we blow up. They're never going to quit. They're exactly not, right. Right. And even when, even when we're talking about Afghanistan, this applies to Iraq so well. I mean, I wonder how many people who planned and endorsed the invasion of Iraq, Pentagon, White House, et cetera, really understand that even though Saddam was a horrible dictator, he had mm -hmm. kept the peace among Sunni, Shia, and Kurds for decades. And I think those from the war hawks who knew a little bit about it thought the Sunni could keep it under control. But I'll bet a lot of people didn't even understand that without strong central leadership, these three groups were going to have a war against each other while we were going to war with the country. They just, again, hubris and mendacity, Joey. Yeah, no, that's a great. I, I've seen the comparisons specific to Saddam to people like Arafat for the same reason. It's the, the idea of keeping the peace. And, and even if we were just a bullshit politician, which Arafat probably was, but he, he did a lot to maintain the peace between these separate factions. And it's another thing people don't understand. If you look at the religious wars between the Sunnis and the Shiites in general, um, those go all the way back to Muhammad. And, you know, his actual lineage and who believes what. And those are really complicated things that, you know, I think that most of the intellectuals in the State Department understand, right? It's like, hey, you're not going to go and switch people's thousands of years of history based on what we believe is a 250-year-old democracy. It's just, it's it, it's just, yeah, it's gobsmacking, which is, is hard to be gobsmacked anymore, <laughs> but right. it really is. 
but it happens over and over again. And one of the another war, I sound like an old man here. Another war I covered for three years was the war at the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, Serbia, Croatia, mm -hmm. and Bosnia. And Tito, the leader of communist Yugoslavia, was not as brutal as a Milosevic, but it was still a police state with a with a better economy. And very few people really understood that Tito kept the Eastern Orthodox Serbs the Catholic Croatians, and the Muslim Bosniaks from killing each other for decades. And when right. he was gone, leaders of those constituent republics, mostly Milosevic in Serbia, for their own selfish ends, used relatively passive ethnic divisions to their own violent advantage. So it's not just Bosnia. It's not just it's all over the world, Joey. We keep making this mistake over and over again because how's that old song go? Don't know much about history. <laughs> yes, I don't know much about history. That's very true. And I think as a as a collective, we, you know, as Americans, we it's not only American history; it's world history. And I think we have a hard time in zooming out to understand the complexity of all of these things, specific to wars, which is kind of a nice segue into our war in Ukraine. I wanted to get your take on that as an expert and a former bureau chief uh, in Moscow. You know, it's, this is from your book as well. It says, the ongoing pandemic, the threat of never-ending fires in the American West, war with Ukraine, and China's increasingly aggressive moves towards Taiwan have awakened America from its 20-year-plus focus on terrorism in the Middle East. The threat posed by the 9-11 attack was consequential, but never existential. And Osama bin Laden was killed in 2011. In the meantime, a new age of danger has emerged. The threats include new weapons and new threats, to be sure, just as they include traditional great power rivalries and new superpowers. The high-end risk was defined with frightening clarity in late 2022 by the four-star general who commands America's nuclear arsenal. And that says the Ukraine crisis that we're in right now. This is just the warm-up, said Admiral Charles Richard, commander of U.S. Strategic Command. The big one is coming, and it isn't going to be very long before we're going to be tested in ways that we have not been tested in a long time. That's pretty dire. It really is. And again, the warnings have been there. You mentioned, you know, the war in Ukraine. Um, Andy and I, our, our book was delayed more than a year by supply chain problems and all of that. And so it came out um, well after the fighting in Ukraine had started. We wrote the book before Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and we predicted he was going to do it because it was all there in front of us. Uh, I covered the Munich Security Conference in 2007 when Putin gave this amazing speech calling out America as a hyperpower, saying that the U.S. wanted to be a hegemon, and basically proclaiming Russia's right over its near ab abroad including Georgia and Ukraine. And I know that whenever you go to the a Hitler analogy, you always lose, but that speech was Putin's Mein Kampf. It was there, my battle plan. It was public, and he was basically ignored because he was viewed as a not even a second-rate power, but a, a, a fuel pump with a few nukes left, right? Well, a year after that speech, he invaded Georgia in 2008, and even though the world now knows Putin's intentions from the invasion of Ukraine a year ago, his first invasion of Ukraine, let's not forget, was in 2014, mm -hmm. right? How did it happen? We talked to the four-star general who was the NATO commander in 2014. He said he'd gotten no tactical warning whatsoever that Putin was going to make that first invasion of Ukraine. Why? Because all of America's intelligence resources after the collapse of the, of the wall were moved from the Soviet Union, from the Soviet states to counterterrorism. So he was blinded to Putin's intentions. And what does that look like? I, I don't you don't have to give specific numbers, but like how many people did we remove from oh. that? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, as they, <laughs> as they say on TV talk shows. Um, on the day the Berlin Wall collapsed, 50 percent, half of the intelligence budget was devoted to the Soviet Union. On 50%. the day, half of it, yes, Holy it was shit. 50. Well, you can use those words. 
My wife doesn't <laughs> let me use those. And by the way, thank you again for quoting Edelman in, in full. That's my favorite quote, but I'm not allowed to say it around the house. Mm. So 50%, yes, a holy shit number of our intelligence budget was devoted yeah. to the Soviet Union the day the Berlin Wall fell. On the day Putin invaded Ukraine the first time in 2014, that 50% had dropped to 15%. And, and, and the number of analysts assigned to the Soviet Union and that periphery on the day the Berlin Wall fell was about 12 or 13,000 people. When Putin invaded Ukraine the first time in 2014, that had dropped to between one and 3,000. That shows wow. that how we, we willfully blinded ourselves by focusing on terrorism and not believing Putin when he said, hey, over here, I'm back. I'm back. And and part of that is what you talked about with the Zoom on terrorism versus our traditional superpower dynamics with folks like Russia. And with that said, it, it, the first thing that I thought about was, did our lack of military intelligence talk? Because a lot of pundits, and this is why it's great to talk to reporters on the ground, I watched a lot of pundits say that there's no way he'll invade. There's no way. He's just, he's just, you know, threatening. He's bunch, he's pumping his chest. He's being Putin. He doesn't have the military might to do it. He doesn't have the patience to do it. And he did it. And, you know, when, as a reporter and someone on the ground, did you, was that kind of the consensus with your sources? Is that, yeah, he's, he's for sure going to do this. It certainly was. And not that I'm so smart or so, so great, but again, the lesson we've learned throughout history is that when dictators and autocrats say they're going to do something, you ought to believe them. Mm -hmm. He announced year after year after year, starting in 2007, that Ukraine was part of Russia. It's not part of Russia. It's been a no. separate country. It was my great thrilling experience to be on the ground over there in the summer of 91 when Ukraine voted for independence from the Soviet Union. And that... Putin has said repeatedly, Joey, year after year, that he was going to take Ukraine back into the Russian fold. I had no doubt he was going to. And to give credit to American intelligence, even though they missed the 2014 invasion, there was clear intelligence before the more recent one. And the CIA and the person of director Bill Burns declassified a lot of the information for public consumption and less and more classified for the allies to make clear that even the U.S. thought he was going in. So I don't want to get mm. ad hominem about pundits who said he wasn't going in a year and a half ago uh, or almost two years now. But to anybody who knows that part of the world, who had right. followed Putin, who read his speeches, there was just no effing way he wasn't going to go in. Okay. And so the, the next big question is, if he's successful in this illegal occupation of Ukraine, a lot of the pundits that I read about talk about if you let this dictator take over this, then Poland's next. Is that so, hyperbole? So I'm not going to predict it's Poland. There are other sites, other locations that might be mo more vulnerable, like Modo Moldova, places yeah. like that. The Baltics are also incredibly vulnerable. Now, they are NATO members, so they're protected under Article, Article 5, the Alliance's Agreement on Self-Defense. But again, looking at history, dictators who are not stopped don't stop. And why on earth would we think that Ukraine would be the last bite of a still unfinished apple that Putin's going to take? Right, because he said to your point, you have to believe it when people, when dictators say what they're going to do, because he does believe that he can bring back the empire of the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, and he's going to do it through fight. He's not That's exactly right. Yeah, um, sort of a, a a slight tweak. I don't think Putin believes he's another Soviet general secretary. He thinks he's the new czar. So he right. he, right. he, <laughs> he has no dreams of global domination like the Kremlin did during the communist right. era. He he has a czarist view of a Russian empire that that right. stretches truly. I mean, you know, my my grandparents came from what is now Poland, but my grandfather's passport had the Russian double-headed eagle on it. I mean, so Russia controlled Poland, Ukraine, the Balts, all that country. So you asked about Poland specifically. 
I, I can't draw the map that's in Putin's mind, but I guarantee, Joey, it does not stop with Ukraine. Okay, and so then that begs the question, whether it's Poland or the Baltics, you're looking at NATO at that point, right? So at we then, do we then jump in and, and we meaning the collective we? Because if not, then what happens? <laughs> right. Putin plays a long game. His, his invasion of Georgia in 2008, the world was so, so angry. This aggression shall not stand. I was in Georgia last summer talking about the, the book, and I drove up to Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Guess what? Russian troops are still there. Um, mm. the, the pieces of Ukraine that Russia took in 2014, still held by, by Russia, you know, how many years later? So, so one thing that dictators do better than democracies, they know how to wait. They know how to be patient. So I'm not saying that, heaven forbid, if Kiev falls to Russians, that Warsaw is next. But look at what Orban is doing in Hungary. I mean, there, there are ways for Putin to win without even invasion. Here's a NATO member that is blocking NATO assistance to, to Ukraine for whatever domestic political reasons the Hungarians see. So there are ways for Putin to keep winning in different ways without using force. And Putin, again, Putin's from that long tradition of Russian chess masters. We in the West, we play checkers. Yeah, you're right. And that's that's just part of the complexity of Russia and its history with the United States specifically, and then what it wants to do. I think that that, again, goes to the bigger narrative within our culture today. I have friends on both sides of the political aisle that think that we need to stay out of this, that, you know, we need to be isolationists. We don't have the money. We don't, but it's not, it's not that anymore. We are a global citizen today, right? America, whether the word, the watchdog or not, is that we need to be part of this global fabric to protect against despots like Putin and she right. and other folks like that. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on the, the whole idea of us just, you know, cutting and running. And, and as you can see with our Congress today, we're still delayed <laughs> on, you know, any funding for Ukraine and the Middle East uh, as we stand today. What does that right. look like to you as an expert? Yeah, so I like to say that everything important in life I learned from three sources, Johnny Cash, the U.S. Army, and my wife. And what the Army <laughs> taught me is 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 to, to divide the world into tactical, operational, and strategic. So your question's great. Let me answer the isolation question first at the operational level. Okay. We're, we're giving like a nickel on every defense dollar to support Ukraine. Five cents on the dollar for Ukrainians to die decimating the Russian army. That, to me, is a national security good. Not a single American soldier is fighting in Ukraine. Right. But so far, that country has halted Putin's illegal and aggressive designs on the rest of the world. Five cents on the dollar seems like a pretty good investment. That's at the operational level. At the big strategic level, which your question goes to, can we be isolationist again? I mean, not unless you believe in like space domes over the continental U.S., because the problems we face today, you can't isolate from. Disease, you can't stop to disease. Um, China's hypersonic missiles, we don't have defenses against them, Joey. Um, the threats of climate change, you can't stop that. I was out talking in, in Wyoming and a rancher out there, you know, you think that Wyoming would be sort of very anti-climate change. All of this farmer's surface water, all the ponds that his cattle drink out of, have deposits of plastics from China carried on the way, on the wind. So how can we isolate wow. ourselves? Exactly. That's why I said, wow. So people talk about we should be more isolationist, turn our back on the world. Tell me how we get those problems to let us turn our backs on them, because they're going to come no matter what. Cyber, the same thing. Global financial markets, supply change. Uh, people who say that America should return to isolationism, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, they're, they're just trying to bury their head in the mud, and it's not going to work. It's just not possible to have an isolationist policy in the modern era. And, and if yes. you disagree, or, or if, if you're listening, tell me, tell me how we isolate from all of the threats that put us at risk. Yeah, no, I, I, I've argued that in the same vein. I don't have your expertise, but I, I think that 
for me, as a student of history, you look at and see what's happening, where we need to arbitrate our disputes. And being the global empire or the, global, the, the, the powerful military that we are, we need to be part of these discussions. And I think that also then lends the discussion to China, right? Which is the other, the superpower that is competing with us now on every front, their modernization of their military, their AI. And, and this is all in spite of their lack of growth, both at the, at the population level and GDP level, they are still coming at us very hard. So let me get read a paragraph that kind of introduced China in your book. It said, economically, America and our friends in Western Europe have courted China to be a responsible stakeholder in our global economy. While at the same time, a large and growing number of our national security folks have been warning us about China's modernization of their military with increasing alarm, specifically since uh, Xi Jinping of, became the leader of the CCP in 2012. So we're, we're starting to see a lot of that specific to, I guess it's not us against China as much as it is, what do we do about Taiwan? And that being a member of that we have, and, and this is to your point as well, we are strategically, we have strategic ambiguity was specific to Taiwan. You want to talk a little bit about that as a policy? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Strategic ambiguity <laughs> is is that we support the one China policy, but we demand that it be done peacefully, which implies that if it's done forcefully, we will come to Taiwan's de 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 defense. And the ambiguity is supposed to have a deterrent quality by not letting China know exactly what we're going to do. But, you know, the point we make in our book and that we've talked about today is that we let China catch up to us and in many ways overtake us mm -hmm. by this 20-year Zoom-like focus on counterterrorism, where every president that I covered for 13 years at the Pentagon said, we're going to pivot to China, we're going to focus on China, but, you know, words without a budget behind them are a fantasy, and we never really pivoted to China. And one of the war gamers we talked to, a three-star general, said that all of the war games conducted in recent years, all they prove is that we lose faster. Because we're just not ready. And just this great point, and if Andy Hohen were here, he would tell you that when he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy in the summer of 2001, Joey, he was tasked to write the Quadrennial Defense Review, this four-year strategic review required by Congress. And Andy said that the whole focus was China. Summer of 2001, we got to look at China. We got to deal with, with China. Then 9-11 came, and he was told to rewrite the whole QDR, 11th hour deadline change to focus on terrorism. And when he asked the leadership, what about China? They said, oh, we have 20 years to figure out China. Well, that was 23 years ago, and we still haven't figured out China. Yeah, you quoted something, and I, it's in my head, not on my notes, but it was something to the effect of, we have two wars that we're worrying about right now. We can't worry about that one. <laughs> right. So, e Exactly. And it doesn't, not to say that some smart people, you know, aren't putting good ideas. There's a lot of thoughts about how we can sort of deter China by a new fleet of swarming drones, kind of like, you know, iPhones on gliders that would help us watch and confuse China. So it's not that we're doing nothing, but so much of our investment like, you know, the aircraft carriers. They're very, very useful in other parts of the world. They're useful in the Middle East, uh, elsewhere, but the aircraft carriers are going to be so vulnerable if we go to a shooting war with China. And we could lose, if a, if a carrier goes down, we could lose as many American military personnel in one day as we lost an entire Afghan war. And this country's not ready for that. Is that how many soldiers are on one of our aircraft carriers. Is it 5,000, 3,000? Yeah, yeah, plus or minus 3,000, depending on how many okay. Marines are on board that. You know, it, it's called, you know, five acres of floating American sovereignty. And don't get me wrong, you're, I don't want to get a bunch of emails from your retired <laughs> na naval listeners saying, Shanker, right. you're crazy. We love it. Look, my, my father-in-law got silver stars flying off the of carriers. I respect the might of the carrier very, very much. But it's not designed for a modern war with China that has an overwhelming number of accurate long-range missiles. Which begs me to have the next point. If you look at the Taiwan Straits crisis in 1995, 1996, and this is, again, trying to understand just say the collective ideology of a government. So you want to talk a little bit about what took place there as an example, and then I'll tell you what my thoughts are. 
yeah, specific please. to the Taiwan Straits crisis? Yeah. Yeah. So it was heating up yet again in the United States in 95. I think how many years ago this was. Yeah. Sailed an aircraft carrier through and said, this is what we can do. This is, again, three acres, five acres of American sovereignty. We have all kinds of weapons on, on board. And they were going to order a second carrier through. But before it even arrived, China stood down because it realized we can't beat that. Well, guess what? Right. Today, China believes it can easily beat that. Right. And that is where I think that if you don't understand, and I don't want to, ego is probably the wrong word, but the collective, the collective ideology of China, specifically Xi, and what he sees, that, that was a humiliation that I don't think they've ever forgotten about. I think it was one of those pieces. And, you know, for my listeners who haven't read this piece since history class, it was, they lobbed a couple bombs, a couple missiles on one side of, of Taiwan and, and the other side, basically just kind of intimating that if we can hit these two sides, we can hit you in the middle. So be very, you know, be forewarned, we're in charge. And then we, which, you know, was military flex, taking these billion dollar aircraft carriers with 3000 men and women aboard ready to, you know, scare them. It worked. And they actually, to your point, they just like, yeah, <laughs> we can't do this. Military is too big. We don't want to mess with America right now. Fast forward. You're like, okay, but they went back and I don't know what those conversations were, but I'd pay to be a fly on the wall because it was, a. I understand the Chinese culture very well. And they were not going to ever have that happen again, ever. And so whatever they needed to put into as far as budgets, and that's what they were going to do. And then they did. <laughs> and that's exactly yeah. what we talked about. No, that's such a great point. And they also put a whole of government on it. So it wasn't just military budget and intelligence and their industrial base, but they put their 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 cyber hacking team on it. I mean, here in the yeah. US, we've we, we've heard for years, oh, we'll be be forewarned of a cyber Pearl Harbor, an adversary will turn off the lights on the East Coast or crash the financial system, all of which I'm sure is possible. But Joey, I think, and we argue in our book, Cyber Pearl Harbor's already happened. And we didn't even notice. It was the Chinese hacking of our defense industrial base to steal trillions of dollars worth of secrets and save them decades of research and development. It's not a surprise that the fifth gen Chinese stealth fighter looks a lot like ours. Why? They stole the blueprints or at least enough materials that they could then retro design it themselves. And they did. And that's actually where another general that I have a lot of respect for, James Mattis, enters the equation. It says, in December of 2018, Mattis unveiled a new strategy in a speech at the Reagan Library that grabbed the attention of his listeners. He and his team had been working on a new defense strategy for the past five years that would set the course for spending over $3.5 trillion over the next five years. So Mattis leaned in during his speech, and this is in your book. I love this because this was powerful. He wanted the audience to understand that the profound lessons of the past were not lost on him. He said forcefully, history is unconfused as to what happens when a democracy permits its strength to wane. We see it in our own history. Osan, Korea, 1950. Soldiers from Task Force Smith went into battle against enemy tanks carrying obsolete bazookas, incapable of knocking out their targets. We might believe that that could never happen in our time. But if the same America that had defeated the Third Reich in World War II could forget in just five years the hard lessons of Anzio, Normandy, and the Bulge, so can we in a generation. And that was like, oof, okay. And then he said, which I loved, we are America. We are not spectators in the arc of history. We make history. <laughs> love, That's why the it's dog. <laughs> love the warrior monk. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, I just, I loved him and I think he's amazing. And so that's, you mentioned it already, but I want you to kind of highlight a little bit because I read about war gaming, but it's a fascinating new approach to war. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the war games? Because you, you have some really cool things in here um, that I will bring up, but why don't you tell me a little bit about war games uh, as well, it relates to your experience? Sure. I mean, war games are a rather amazing way, you know, to to really 
exercise the the the, the planning and capabilities. As I said, uh, a three-star Air Force general who's one of their biggest thinkers said that all the war games about China taught us is that we were losing faster. And another terrific war game we write about last year, the Navy ran its very first war game based around climate change. And and yeah. it, was a, it was a great, great war game, Joey. It 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 posited a, a naval uh, um, group of ships and Marines were going to make a forced amphibious landing on a hostile island. But one of those new age superstorms came up. And as all of your listeners and viewers know, storms are getting, you know, more fierce. And so the storm split the lines of, of the ships, helicopters, planes couldn't take off. And even more so, years and years of superstorms had denuded all of the infrastructure in the area to support them. So what we've learned about climate change from that very first naval war game on climate conducted last year is that climate itself won't defeat us, but just as the military has force multipliers, climate is an adversary multiplier. It makes everything that we want to do harder and more dangerous, from stabilizing the Middle East to dealing with migration. And so the Navy war game was a real wake-up call, and I my, my, my hat's off to the smart folks in our fleet force for actually having the courage to test climate as opposed to just testing the Chinese military. Right. And they... And to my memory, they extrapolated the climate change progression out to 2050, right? right. That's when this, this battle took, or actually 2030. 2030, right. 2030, yeah. when this battle took place. And, and in your book, the, the, back, the actual deleterious effects are giant troughs scattered the warships out of formation. Howling winds made operations and air rescue impossible. Communications were shredded. <laughs> you're like when you're playing a war game like this, I can't imagine these wonderfully intelligent intellectuals sitting around going, "Yeah, we just got our ass kicked." <laughs> and, and to your earlier point, now we're going to ask kicked badly today. From what we did three months ago, it's we got our ass kicked faster, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Exactly. So it's it's gotten worse. Right. That's it's not good. It's not good. Right. One of the things I wanted to talk about, um, as far as their flex, and I have to find in my notes here, but um, they. Or was it? It it they talk about moving, they built islands <laughs> on the Red Sea, right? So they actually, what did they moved? I can't find it in my notes here, but it was oh, here it is. In 2013 and 14, reports began flowing of China's land reclamation projects in the South China Sea. Over a period of 200 days, China's Sky King, a new self-propelled dredger and something of a technological marvel moved some 13 million tons of sand and seawater onto the reef, which was more than three times the number of cubic yards of concrete needed to build the Hoover Dam. So outside of that being ridiculously awesome on its front, just the pure scale of that, with little or no warning or assessment, the U.S. policy community was left to sit and watch China create new island territory in contested parts of the South China Sea. They did that in 200 days. Right. So you want right. to talk about how fast we need to pivot to be ready. Right. Well, this I mean, type we, used of thing. To, we used to be the country that did great things, right? Man on, on the moon, um, you know, Hoover all these <laughs> <Right>. Hoover, <laughs> Joey, thanks. Hoover Dam, right? One of the wonders yeah. of, of the world. China decided to do it. And one thing about dictatorships, they can be efficient. And what China is doing and continues to do tries to change the facts on the ground, or in this case, the facts on the water. By creating new island chains, it allows China to expand its territory claims and attempt to keep the U.S. and its allies out. And, and just lest your, your listeners think that we are, 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 you know, doom and gloom about China, we also shouldn't forget that China has some, some liabilities too. I mean, China's facing a demographic bomb, the likes mm -hmm. of which no country's ever seen. Declining nope. population growth, perhaps of the double digits. The U.S. has allies. China only has clients. Now, China's clients are very loyal, but one hopes that allies are even more loyal. So Andy and I are not predicting we will be defeated by China, but the balance of power and influence is clearly at risk. And worth our military investment. I think that's really what I gleaned from that, specific to whatever those mechanisms look like. If we're actually going to battle in Taiwan, it's not going to be with aircraft carriers. It's going to be something different. 
Right. And just one more thought to your very good thought is, let's hope that we don't battle over Taiwan. And if we do nothing, we make that battle almost a fait accompli for, for China. All the yeah. things that Andy and I write about, the new technologies, the swarming drone systems, that isn't about winning a war with China. It's about making the Chinese leadership say, oh, the U.S. has figured out what to do. Hmm, maybe we won't be, success, be successful. Maybe we should wait another day. Exactly. That's what we want. The essence of deterrence is injecting doubt into the minds of the Chinese leadership. Let's hope we don't fight over Taiwan. Let's hope we can continue deterring over Taiwan. Yeah, no, work for us in Russia. <laughs> so good work for us again. So now we can end this, sir, on climate change. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of the chat, what I was really taken aback by and you know this as a reporter, our culture is so divided on almost everything today. Climate change is one of those topics. It doesn't matter who you talk to. I have groups that think it's a hoax. I have, it's a, you know, it's a bunch of lies. And I have people that say we are going to, and then on the other side say that it's so bad that we're all going to perish within the next 10 years. So there's a lot of discussions going on, most of which are nonsense. But what was neat for me, specific to this book, is that you frame this through the lens of military personnel and academics and intellectuals and thinkers that are charged with the duty of remedying the climate change issues, which are many and fraught with peril. And you gave many good examples in there. You want to talk a little bit about that specific to China, because that I really enjoyed how you brought it up. Let me say this. I'll read this because you wrote this. Although elected leaders, TV talking heads, and many in public will still argue the reality of climate change, it's politics. The military doesn't have that luxury. Climate change is an existential threat to our nation's security, and the Department of Defense must act swiftly and boldly to take this challenge and prepare and damage that cannot be avoided, said Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Every day, our forces contend with the grave and growing consequences of climate change, from hurricanes and wildfires that inflict costly harm to U.S. installations and constraints our ability to train and operate, to dangerous heat, drought, and floods that can trigger crises and instability across the globe. I mean, that's, that's the difference. When you're looking at <laughs> numbers and money, right? We talked off camera about if you really want to know what's going on with climate change, talk to actuarials, because actuarial mm -hmm. tables will tell you, hey, whether you guys believe climate change or not, we can't ensure this new high sky rise in Miami because it's going to be underwater in 15 years or 20 years or whatever it may be. So we need to actually, not only with our insurance companies, but our reinsurance companies, we need to make sure that everyone through this chain of you know cash, if you will, understands how much we're going to be doling out based on right. climate change. I mean, <laughs> military is even bigger. <laughs> right. I mean, I love your story and mine, mine is the same. Andy and I have been really sort of, we're almost, you know, um, evangelical about trying to return our country to a bipartisan, calm foreign policy. And I was talking to some uh, some business leaders in South Texas, one of whom said the same thing that you just said. He said, huh. none of the guys on the 18th green at my golf club believe in climate change. But he said that since he is a, a South uh, Texas developer, he says, call my insurance adjuster. <laughs> <laughs> He'll talk to you about climate change, and it really yep. had an effect on him. And so if you tell people in ways that it's meaningful to them, you, you, you can be a hard red state Republican, but you need to believe in climate change because you're not going to be able to do your business. Um, and the military, even more so, everything the military does will be harder because of climate change. Mass migration is going to be incredibly de destabilizing. There will be fewer training days possible because the military can't train when it's above a certain temperature. In all of our wars, except for Vietnam, the National Guard has gone to war with the active duty troops. Guess what? They can't anymore. Why? Because they're busy fighting wildfires and dealing with hurricanes that are worse than they've ever been because of climate change. These are real world examples that whether the people who wear a uniform are Democrat or Republican, Republican, the military understands that the climate is an enemy and does the business of all of our enemies to make it harder for us. And, and that is a, not a number, and I'm pointing this from memory, so if I screw up, help me out, but the National Guard is about 450,000 people right. that we have deployed throughout the United States for these exact issues. And then you also have in your book here that the World Bank analysis 
of 2050 describes a horrific rise in climate-related migration with these with these projections, East Asia and the Pacific will have 49 million people displaced. South Asia, 40 million. North Africa, 19 million. Latin America, 17 million. Eastern Europe and Central Asia, 5 million. And for the far more catastrophic situations in the Sub-Saharan Africa, 86 million will be displaced by 2050, which is, you know, what, 200 plus million human beings. Right. Europe is not ready for that African migration north. And again, I'm a nonpartisan person, yeah. but all of all of the Republicans who want to build the border wall and deny climate change, right? What do they need to do when millions more, million tens of millions more people from Latin America start moving north because of climate? Right. And and that is the incongruency of the policy. Of you the can't policy. say, right? So it's it's one of those things where that's where if we could actually stop hating each other, we could say, hey, this is happening. Doesn't matter why, right? Doesn't, right? doesn't matter if it's caused by humans, but our planet's heating up for whatever reason. And because of that, three inches of sea level rise causes this level of migration based on deleterious effect on their land. Like they can no longer fish. They can no longer hunt. They can no longer farm. They have to leave because they actually will die if they stay. And that is a whole different issue when they come across. They're like, we're coming. We have to come. Right, and right. Part of the beauty of like human condition is that we are survivors. We're resilient people, human beings. So we have to go. It's not like, oh, we're just going to stay here in sub-Sahara. We have to go into Europe. And, right. <laughs> and that's not going to work. We know right. that. And, and that's why we talked earlier about the 30 in the name of this podcast. But the true part of it is just as important. And what you just said is what Andy and I hope will become the debate. Please, people, just look at the facts. Put aside red or blue right. or how you'll vote in November of 24. But the facts are climate change. We're not at a tipping point. It's too late. Climate change is real and it's happening. Don't politicize it. And if you're if you want to build a border wall, if you want to halt migration, those can be your policies, but you cannot deny climate change because there isn't a wall tall enough to keep out tens of millions of people. So you've got to sit down and deal with these problems based on facts. Please. Right. And and is that because your book itself was really it's the best excerpt. I mean, it's you took very complex problems and made them very understandable. And 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 for lay people like myself. So was that your goal with writing this book? Did you guys just like, hey, you know, we've been in this, we've been in the trenches, we know what's going on. A lot of this is really complex. Let's hammer this book out. I, I did hear in one of your interviews, it took you four years to write this book. So obviously it was a labor of love and tons of research and lots of experience specific to your own expertise, as well as th those you surrounded with over the last 40 years of your career. Was that the goal of this book? You're you're a very insightful reader because the answer is uh, absolutely yes. Andy and I, even though we're Washington creatures, believe these questions are too important to be left to politicians in Washington. We, we really want to engage in national debate, which is why podcasts are like the new way to get out to the public. So again, thank you for having me. But we really want everybody to talk about the, these problems. We made it a very human book. It's not wonky. We tell no. great anecdotes. We introduce you to some really heroic people. Uh, we call balls and strikes, not based on politics, but the facts. But we really hope to inspire a national debate. And so we wrote it for a general readership. And about the, the four years in labor of love, uh, it really was. And I have to tell you that over those four years, Andy and I only had one significant argument. He and his wife like canoeing, and my wife and I like kayaking. Other than that, we agreed on just about everything. <laughs> cool, that's good. And what did you guys agree on? Because at the end of your book, you asked, what is to be done? And that was the whole last section of it. Why don't you try to encapsulate that? Obviously, you can't do it all, but what is to be done? Sure. You know, when Andy and I go to college campuses among them, you know, the students think, oh, here's, you know, old bald guy from Washington. He's here to advocate for more defense spending. Yeah. Believe it or not, 
We are not advocating for more defense spending unless it's needed. One point yeah. two trillion should be enough. It should be spent wiser and on the right things. And we're also not advocating a major muscle movement like after nine eleven, when mm -hmm. you know DHS was invented and DNI and Northern Command. We think that there's a way to deal with these problems. Russia, China, climate, food security, data security, by getting all the people together from all across the government who work on these specific problems. The military would call it, you know, a joint task force. And you have the folks from each department responsible get together four times a year, six times a year, do war games, talk about what supplies would be needed, have each other's phone numbers in their speed dial. So when these crises hit, and Joey, they will. Yeah. It's not a pickup game. You're not starting at zero. And the perfect example is Operation Warp Speed. You know, people think that, you know, that we're anti-Trump or pro-Biden. We're not. That was a Trump invention. And it worked. We started at zero miles per hour, but all the right people came together, a miracle of public-private partnership. And we had a vaccine in our arms the fastest in history. And mm -hmm. when that happens again, warp speed will be the model for a pandemic coming together of the entire government with the private sector. We need that model applied and put in place today for all of the risks that we write about. It doesn't require hiring more people because they get to keep their day jobs, but they come right. to these to these joint task forces and they get ready for zero day when the next crisis hits. And I think that the pandemic analogy is apt for a couple of reasons. It wasn't isolated to one country. Right. Correct. It's the same thing as it relates to what can be done. Do we have, do you have the confidence that, because one of the big pushbacks, and I think it's a relatively valid one uh, from people around climate change, is if they do acquiesce, say, all right, I, I, it is. But India and China are polluting so much more than we are, and they're not going to, they're not going to jump in and do this collectively. So we're going to lose economically. They're going to continue to flourish and the planet's going to burn anyway. What does that look like for you in the sense of, because Operation Warp Speed was, I think, one of the most successful things I've ever seen with collective governments. Right. And obviously because we had a collective goal, <laughs> which was like, we might die. It doesn't matter where you live. doesn't matter what color your skin is. It's like we human beings are susceptible to this virus that we don't understand. And so we're a little scared. Let's circle the band, let's circle the wagons, get people together. Do you think that there will be an inflection point with climate change, not only for Americans, but for global nations to like right. embrace this as a group? Right. So I was at the grocery store this morning picking up a cup of coffee and it's very windy in Washington today. So there was a plastic bag rolling across the parking lot and I bent to pick it up and I put it in, in the trash can. This guy walking in near me said, why are you doing that? You can't pick up every plastic bag. And I said, just because you can't do everything doesn't let you do nothing. And, and so and so honestly, your, your point about Russia and China not stopping their carbon emissions, just because Russia and China won't stop doesn't let us keep polluting. Because again, as I said earlier, we're not at a tipping point, Joey. We are past it. And the right. big thing is what happens after two degrees? Two degrees is, is, is the warmth. If we can cap global temperature, global temperature rise at two degrees, we will maintain life on Earth. And so we need to do everything we can not to, I mean, it'd be great if we could reverse it, not possible. It'd be great right. if we could stop it, not possible. But we have to do our part, regardless of what other people do, to not hit that two, not to go above that two degree rise in global temperatures. And so great question. Who cares what China and Russia do? If everybody else did their part, we have a future on planet Earth. That's a great way to end it, sir. We need to all pick up our own plastic bags in front of us, right? That's what we need to do. And I commend you and Andrew for this book. It was a romping read. I really enjoyed it. I learned a ton. And as I mentioned before, it was done in such a way that you took the complexity of 40 years and made it relatively easy for us to understand and comprehend. So thank you very much. And again, thank you for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. This was an absolutely fantastic discussion. I enjoyed it. And I was really honored to be here, Joey. Thank you. Thank you.